That's a little more touchy, isn't it? Not what I want, but here's what I require. What doth the Lord require of thee? Look what he says. But to do justice, to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Pastor, I just don't know what God wants for my life. Well, the Bible tells you here, this is, this is what God wants. By the way, stop for just a moment. Until we learn to do the simple things God's given us to do, don't expect Him to show us the special things He wants us to do. What is it that God wants? What does God require of thee? Look, please. To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. With thy God. These three things are all tied together. They all, they all go hand in hand. In the Christian life, God has given us a specific task and God has given us a specific purpose. Every one of us have a purpose that God has given us. You say, in the Christian life, what are those things that I'm practically to do, Pastor? What are the things, practically speaking, that I know God wants me to do? There are five of them. You can write them down. I was taught them a long time ago. Every one of us are to read God's Word. Every one of us ought to pray. Why? Because I can go to the Bible and I can show you in the context of Scripture when God says, this is what I want, He's not speaking about something else. There's no, there's no hidden agenda. God says we're to study the Word of God. We're to read the Word of God. We're to apply the Word of God. We're to trust the Word of God. We're to read the Word of God. He said, so make the Bible a part of your life. He said, you ought to pray. God made that pretty plain, didn't He? Pray without ceasing. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. He said, we're to, we're to study God's Word. We're to pray. We're to be faithful to the house of God. No Christian will ever be right with God that's wrong with the church of God. Can I say that again? No Christian, you say, Pastor, that's your opinion. That's not my opinion. That's Bible. No Christian will ever be right with God that is wrong with the work of God. You ought to love your church. I love this church. Hey, I don't try to tear this church down. You say, is it a perfect church? No, you're in it. If it was perfect, when I became the pastor, I messed it up. There ain't no perfect church. There's only a perfect God. And because we have a perfect God, we can enjoy the church that God has given us. I love my church. Say that with me. I love my church. Repeat it. I love my church. I love my church. I love being here. We are to be faithful to the house of God. Those things, practically speaking, we're to read God's Word. We're to study God's Word. We're to make the Bible part of our life. We're to pray. We're to be faithful to the house of God. We're to witness. When God gave the command to go, He did not give it to a specific group for a certain time. He gave it for all time. You say, how do we know when God is done saving all the people that's going to be saved? When God calls us home, that's when we know God is done. When the Lord returns, that's how we know, the Lord, that, that's how we know God is done. Every one of us ought to be a part of that. Every one of us as Christians are to play some role in the gospel. There are people in your life and people in my life that no one else will touch with the gospel. But God put us there to touch them with the gospel. We're to be a witness. By the way, every one of us are a witness for something or someone. You're advertising for something. They used to say, if it's not for sale, don't advertise it. You're advertising something. You're selling something. Every one of us are, are, are pointing to something. And, and you may say, well, I, I just don't say anything. No, you're saying something. You're saying something to your neighbors. You're saying something to your family. You're saying something to your children. You're saying something to your church family. You're saying something to your pastor. You're saying something to your Sunday school class. We're to be a witness. We're to, we're to let the Bible impact our life. We're to pray. We're to be faithful to the house of God. We're to be a witness. And we're to give. Every time a pastor says the word give, people automatically go to money. They automatically think of money. I've learned this in ministry, and I'm learning this, and God is helping us. If God captures our heart, He'll have no problem taking care of our wallet. You see, God doesn't need our money. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll stop giving. Go ahead. God will take care of that. By the way, God can still supply even if you don't give. We don't give because God needs our money. We give because we need God's blessing. 
We give out a heart of love. God, I need you to help me. I can't do this on my own. But understand this. God wants you to give more than just your wallet. He wants your life. Every Christian needs two days. You know what they are. The day of salvation. You cannot be a Christian without Jesus Christ. Can you say amen there? You can't be a Christian without Jesus Christ. There's the day of salvation. But secondly, there must be the day of surrender. What is that day? The day we give our life. Lord, whatever you want, I'll do. Whatever you desire, I'll be. To give. God wants all that. What does the Lord require thee? He says, listen, practically speaking, here's what all of us do. But he says, I want you to understand this. In your relationship with God, here's what God wants for you to do justly. What does he want? He wants faithfulness in your walk. I'm sorry, faithfulness in your work. To do justly. To do right. To be honest, to have integrity. To be a person of character. We don't hear words like that in our culture today. Those are offensive. Those are unnecessary. Those may cause someone to feel bad about themselves. Listen to me. Understand this. When we are confronted with the truth of who we really are, it will bring conviction. We say, well, I don't like feeling guilty. Conviction is not guilt. You see, the conviction of the Holy Spirit has a purpose. Guilt is placed to make you feel bad. When a person is pronounced guilty in a courtroom, that means they are sentenced. They are, that, that guilt is hung about their neck. They will serve that time. They will pay that price. They will, they will be characterized by that. It is placed upon them. It is a burden. That's not the purpose of conviction. The purpose of conviction is to draw you to Christ. It's for you to see the love of God. To do right. So when we're confronted with the truth of our life, and God says to do justly, to do right. When we don't do right, we're convicted. And why does God convict us? Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. God convicts us. Listen, the purpose of God's conviction is never to build a wall. Have you ever thought about this? When things happen in our life that we have to make right, there are always two sides of the response. There's the side that how God responds to us when we do wrong. He convicts us of our sin. He chastises us. But we also have the responsibility to respond in the right manner to Jesus, to God. There's sometimes we face the conviction and the chastisement of the Lord, but understand this, the purpose of all that God does is to draw us closer to Himself. The Bible says God can't fellowship with darkness. What fellowship has light with darkness? How can two walk together except they be agreed? So when the Lord convicts us, when He chastises us, He's trying to draw us back to Himself. He's trying to bring us to Himself. But yet, when we don't respond correctly to that, when we don't respond, let me say it this way, biblically to that, you know what happens? We build a wall. And we say things like, oh, that just wasn't fair. That wasn't right. I, I just don't like that. You know what's happening? We're not responding. We're not doing justly. We're not doing right. Dr. Rice used to say, do right. If the stars fall from heaven, do right. The Lord always blesses obedience. He says to do justly, that we're to be, there's to be faithfulness in our, in our work. But secondly, look what he says here. We've, we've covered this in Sunday school. I don't want to repeat myself for some of you, but I want to help those who weren't here. He says to do justly and to love mercy. To love mercy. I love the word love there. I've heard many times people describe mercy and grace this way. Grace is us not getting what we deserve. And mercy is us getting what we do not deserve. But the Lord uses the word in describing mercy, he said, or not describing mercy, but how we are to approach mercy, but to love mercy. We are to love the fact that God gives us what we do not deserve. That we come to a place in the Christian life that we understand that every good thing, and listen, we, we have to be told this, uh, over and over again, someone once told us a long time ago that repetition is the key to learning. How many remember writing the multiplication tables? Your teacher would say, write your, write your twos 12 times. Oh, my goodness. Where was copy and paste when I was in school? <laughs> <laughs> Re 
Repetition is the key to learning. Yet how often do we in the Christian life sometimes separate ourselves from this truth that, that somehow the good things in our life came because of who we are? Every good thing in our life comes from God. Every good blessing comes from God. Everything that benefits us comes from God. By the way, do you know that sometimes things that are good for us don't always seem good to us? What you meant for evil, God meant for good. Sometimes the things that are good for us don't always seem good to us. But every good thing in our life, and he says we're to love mercy. How are we going to love mercy? Well, there has to be a faithfulness in the work, but there must be fellowship in his word. Where do we get the message of mercy from? Where do we get it from? You get it from the word of God. You get it from the Bible. That fellowship in his word. How many, how many of us this week have neglected our, our Bible? How many of us this week have had a letter mailed to us from God with, with if you will, I remember being in college and my wife was home. Or she was she was my fiance at that time after I tricked her into marrying me and uh, getting married to me or at least saying she was going to marry me. Uh, I remember she was at, in Michigan. She was planning our wedding and I would get letters in the college and, and I could tell Miss Faye when I had gotten one. I would walk into the college administration building where the post office was and, and my nose was like a bloodhound. There was a certain scent and I was on it. She had, she had doused that letter in perfume. How many ladies ever did that? Don't lie to me. Raise your hand. And you say, I sprayed perfume on a letter I sent my husband. Thank you, Brittany. You're the only honest one. The rest of y'all need to get right with God. If you hadn't done it, you probably ought to try it, ma'am. He might bring you flowers every once in a while. You do that. Man, she, she would send a letter, and I could hear it. Man, I was like a bird dog on point. Man, I was there. So I'd open that letter. Whew, we're like... You know, I don't even remember what the perfume was. It could have been, you know, I don't know. But I knew I'd gotten a letter. Can you imagine getting a letter every day from God with his love all over it? And we just throw it on the counter and think, I'll pick it up later. How we, he said to love mercy. How are we ever going to learn to act like Jesus when we never take the time to learn how Jesus acted? Love mercy. Thirdly, look at this one. He says that we're to do justly, that we're to love mercy. Look at the next thing he says. And to walk humbly with thy God. To walk humbly with thy God. There's a faithfulness in our work. There's a fellowship in his word. But finally, there's a fruitfulness from our walk. To walk humbly with thy God. None of us who are where we are tonight arrived here on our own. Say, right. Pastor, I drove here tonight in the car I paid for. Who do you think gave you the job? Jesus. Gave you the help to get up this morning and breathe. To walk humbly. To walk humbly with thy God. Listen to me. We are, we are living in a culture that is doing all they can to make Jesus one of the buddies. You need to teach your children to respect and reverence God. He's not your bubba. He's not your bro. You're not hanging with Jesus. No, no, no. That, that, that's, that's not the God of the Bible. You study Scripture and anyone who ever approached the Lord did it with fear and trembling. We're to walk humbly. We're to, we're to respect and reverence the Lord the things of the Lord. I remember being in church. And man, when I was a kid growing up, you didn't mess around in church. You didn't mess around with the church. When we were children growing up, people who didn't even go to church respected the church. I didn't mess around in church because my dad knew where every stick and limb and broken piece of wood was in this place. There were many places in this building that were used as, I, I felt like they were used as interrogation rooms without the interrogation. Man, it's a bad thing, Brother Elmer, when your daddy can whip you before you get home and you don't got to wait till you get home. 
Amen. We were, we were taught to respect the church. Listen, when the preacher was preaching, it wasn't game time. He said to walk humbly with our God. In other words, our spirit is to be one of God. I, I can't even believe you've given me this opportunity. God, thank you for letting me be a part of your family. Thank you for letting me serve you. Thank you for letting me teach that class. Thank you for letting me, Lord, drive that bus. Thank you for letting me help in that area. Help and let me uh, play an instrument. Lord, giving me the talent to play an instrument. Lord, thank you for letting me sing. Lord, thank you for letting me preach. God, thank you for loving me enough to put me in the service with you. These young men were with us tonight. We had dinner before the service. And one of them asked me, they said, what have you learned about ministry? And I thought, man, I don't, there are a lot of things I, I probably should have learned that I'm still trying to learn. I said this to him. I said, listen, when you clear away everything else about ministry, all the programs, all the administration, all the particulars, when you clear it all away, when you push it all aside, here's what you find. Ministry is about people. It's about helping people where they are. And you can have all the programs that you want to have, but until you help people, until you help people, you're missing the picture. I said to them, as long as you learn to love and help people, you'll have a place in ministry. There are people that God has gifted with administration. There are people that God has gifted with this talent or that talent. And people that God has gifted to be able to do this or to think this way or to organize this. And I understand all those are needed. But the truth of the matter is this. After we peel all of it back, God says, what are you doing for people? And as long as you love and you, you serve. And listen, serving people is not easy. It's not easy. There's sometimes you get the business end of a hissy fit and you don't even know why it's there. Sometimes people need somebody to yell at. Some people need people to blame. And that's part of ministry. You've got to help people where they are. You've got to clear the weeds and get to the heart of the matter. And the heart is this person needs Jesus. To walk humbly with thy God. You know what this church needs their pastor to do? To do justly. To love mercy. To walk humbly with thy God. You know what this pastor needs his church to do? To do justly. To love mercy. To walk humbly with thy God. God puts all the pieces together. And in the end, it's all about him. It's about what God is doing in your life. What's God doing in my life? I just don't know what the Lord wants. I'm not sure what God has for my life. Are you doing these things? Is there faithfulness? Is there fellowship? Is there fruit? God said, by their fruit, you'll know them. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one toward another. I can't make someone love me back. But I'm not responsible for what they do. There are too many people that are, that are too consumed with controlling what everybody else does. Instead of worrying about what they're doing. Sometimes we just have to love people that don't love us back because we want to be obedient to the Lord. Sometimes we have to love people when, when it's hard. Why? Because I want to love the Lord. To walk humbly with thy God. God, I don't deserve this. Hey, church, God's blessed us. To sit in a service like this tonight, hear songs like this, and open the word of God, God's good to us, but we don't deserve it. Do you appreciate it? Oh, I appreciate it, I appreciate it. Don't tell me, show me. Don't talk about it, do it. Don't just hear. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. What does God want? This is what the Lord requires of you, to justly to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Lord, we thank you tonight for blessing us and being good to us. We thank you for your word that's true. Lord, we do praise you for who you are. We give you the glory. We thank you for loving us and blessing us. And God, help each one of us to be obedient, to be what we ought to be, that we, that we love you, Lord, the way we ought to love you. We walk humbly with you. God, we love mercy.